Hello my fellow night crawlers. Welcome to a brand new video. As usual, grab your blankets and grab your snacks and get comfortable because today we're looking into the case of Lisa Ann French. Right now, it is officially the end of spooky season, unfortunately, but that doesn't mean that we get to take away from all the fun. There's jack-o'-lanterns, there's Halloween candy, and there's all sorts of amazing costumes to be worn. Dressing up and going trick-or-treating is probably one of the most long-awaited events in any person's childhood. There's nothing more fun than throwing on a costume, going out with your buddies, and hanging around the neighborhood. And the most important part of all of that is, you know, getting as much candy as you can possibly fit in your stomach. All while doing all this stuff, it's actually creating lasting memories for you, your friends, and especially your parents. Or at least that's how it used to be. For nine-year-old Lisa's parents, on October 31st of 1973, that day lives in infamy for them. To them, on that Halloween, nothing, not a scary movie, not a spooky ghost, compares to the horrors that they had to endure when Lisa didn't come home on Halloween night. Lisa Ann French was born on June 2, 1964, in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, to parents Alan French and Marion Gehrig. By the time of her disappearance, Lisa lived at 192 Armory Street in a neighborhood of Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, together with her mother, stepfather, Bruce DePau, and newborn half-brother Michael. That year, in 1973, Lisa was a fourth grader at Chegwin Elementary School. She had deep brown eyes and the shag haircut that was given to her by her beautician mother. Lisa's friends remember her being funny, bubbly, and she had a constant smile on her face and would light up the people around her. That cheerful grin revealed new teeth coming in, as shown in her class photo. Unfortunately, this was one of the last pictures ever taken of Lisa alive. Like many children, Lisa was very excited to go trick-or-treating on Halloween night. She was constantly trying to pry her mother to go as a butterfly. However, her mother, Marion, thought that that costume would be too thin for a cold night like Halloween. So, to be more comfortable with the frigid air of Halloween night, she decided to go in a hobo outfit instead. Her jeans were covered in masking tape, she had a floppy felt hat, and she wore a green parka. She added a few freckles to her face, kissed her family goodbye, and went out to go trick-or-treating. The original plan was that Lisa would meet one of her closest friends, Ann Parker, and head to Pumpkin Place, a block on the East Bank Street where her parents were hosting an outdoor party. As still happens today, back then, rumors of poison Halloween candy and razor blades left in apples were circulating all over the country. Even though poison treats and dangerous apples are extremely rare, it was a smart move from the parents to create a place where children could celebrate Halloween safely. But unfortunately, nothing went as planned. You see, Anne was never able to join Lisa that night in Halloween. Anne got in trouble with her parents, she got grounded basically. So that left Lisa having to go trick-or-treating by herself. To this day, Anne wonders how Halloween would have really went had she gone with Lisa. Would they have ended the night together wondering what types of candies they got and how much they could fit in their stomach? Or would it actually end up two children being missing. It is known that Lisa did stop at a classmate's house and then stopped at a teacher's house by the name of Karen Bucknett. Her trick-or-treating eventually led her to the house of 25-year-old Gerald Miles Turner Jr. Turner lived at 152 Rose Avenue. Gerald was a close friend of the French family. He was a very trusted person to be around. After all, Lisa would actually visit there often, showing off new sorts of things that she got, maybe a new toy, some sort of grade, Whatever. So, when Lisa rang Gerald's doorbell and said, trick or treat, she expected some sort of chocolate bar or some sort of Halloween treat. Lisa stepped into the doorway without any hesitation and then that night disappeared. When Gerald's girlfriend, Arlene Penny, returned home at 7.15 p.m. from Pumpkin Place, Gerald was acting very strange. He was wearing a bathrobe and claimed multiple times that he was feeling sick without any further explanation. On top of all of this, he was pacing back and forth between the bedroom and the living room, the bedroom and the living room. He would occasionally stop sometimes to lay on the bed for unknown reasons, maybe to catch his breath or something, but things were a little off. Arlene didn't necessarily think too much of it. She had plans to go see her mother, so she wasn't really too worried about it. Maybe Gerald was just a little tired. Maybe he just needed some rest. She left around 8 p.m. to go see her mother, blissfully unaware of what her boyfriend was hiding in the bathroom right next to their bedroom. By that time, Lisa had already exceeded her curfew. She was supposed to be home by 7, so when she wasn't home by 7.30, the mother got a little worried. 
but by the time it reached 10 o'clock, it was very apparent that something was wrong. It was at this point that everyone in the neighborhood started to realize that someone that they knew was missing. Betty Wafiel, head of the block parents, called about 50 other parents on surrounding blocks and asked everybody to turn on their porch lights and put signboards in their windows. Police immediately began an all-night search, and as there were still no signs of Lisa the next morning, close to 5,000 people joined to help. Any sorts of means that are utilized to track people were utilized in this instance. The National Guard was taking the skies. Police officers and local communities were sifting the ground, checking in wooded areas. There were volunteers that had frickin' horses going into the woods. There were 6,000 copies of Lisa's face distributed amongst multiple neighborhoods to try and find this child. They even offered 25 gallons of free gas to the people that were utilizing their vehicles to find Lisa. Everyone did their best to try to bring Lisa home, but unfortunately, it was already too late. On November 3rd, 1973, at 11.30 a.m., around two and a half days after Lisa's disappearance, a farmer named Gerald Braun was returning home in Teichita, just off the Highway 49. On his way, Gerald noticed two trash bags in the brush along McCabe Road and stopped to take a closer look. One bag contained some sort of clothing. It appeared to be a Halloween costume of some sort. In the other bag though, to Gerald's horror, were the remains of an individual that happened to wear a hobo costume a few days earlier on Halloween night. Lisa Ann French. Searches for the missing girl had ended in one of the worst ways possible. A former officer in the local sheriff department, Wayne Geis, had this to say. It was the worst possible thing that could have happened. I saw that little girl, and I don't know how any man could do that. There definitely is not some sort of easy explanation to how an individual would murder an innocent girl, put her body in a trash bag, and dump it. The autopsy revealed even more shocking details. Lisa had been sexually assaulted, and she died from asphyxiation and circulatory shock endured from the sexual trauma that she went through. The community was understandably in shock, furious, and outraged, especially Lisa's parents. On November 6, 1973, Lisa Ann French was laid to rest at a church in Fond du Lac, surrounded by the crowd that had prayed so hard for her to be alive. Now all that was left to do was to find Lisa's killer. As you can guess, it did not take long for the police department to make the connection between Lisa and Gerald Turner, their neighbor. And even then though, it took nine months for Gerald to confess on August 8th of 1974. Gerald admitted that it was highly sexually motivated when he killed Lisa. He lured her to his bedroom, sexually assaulted her, and then murdered her. Gerald claimed that he had actually attempted to revive Lisa, but was interrupted when his girlfriend arrived home. So instead of trying to save the life of nine-year-old Lisa, he decided to just toss her in the bathroom, put her body in a trash bag, and then toss her out as if she were trash. Of course, during his trial, Gerald denied ever doing any of these things. He said that he just confessed because, quote, I got sick and tired of being harassed by police calling on me. Luckily, Gerald's ridiculous story did not convince the jury who found him guilty of second degree murder, enticing a child for immoral purposes and acts of sexual perversion. He was sentenced to 38 years and six months in prison on February 4th of 1975. Then in 1992, Gerald was paroled on sightings of good behavior after being in jail for 17 years and eight months. Obviously, this didn't last for long. People were immediately outraged and he got thrown back in. Gerald's case actually led to Wisconsin creating a sexual predator law named after him. The so-called Turner's Law was passed in 1994 after the state had blocked his parole. Of course, this is not the end of it. Gerald has been in and out of prison for many, many years. He was once again returned to jail to serve 15 and a half years because he decided to violate his parole in 2003. Gerald's current status is unknown right now, but what is known for sure is that Lisa's parents are doing everything that they can to ensure that this person doesn't hurt anyone else. Even though it has almost been 50 years since Lisa's death, she has not been forgotten. Because of the unimaginable crime that happened so long ago, the community, even to this day, has Halloween during daylight hours 
from three to five. So while time has healed the wounds on the surface, a scar still remains, reminding people that those scary Halloween stories sometimes are true after all. Oh man, that was a rough one, I'm being honest. As usual, when it comes to victims of crime cases, I put their find a graves in the description. If you want to leave a message on Lisa's find a grave, you can do so below. Before we hop in the end segment though, I would like to thank my Tormented Knights and my Knighted Patreons. For my Tormented Knights, we have Levi and Will. For my Knighted Patreons, we have Emma, Kay Duckworth, Kira, Lucas, Monkey Cool, Shizen, Teddy, and Timo, and TD Darklight. Thank you guys so much. Your support really does assist and help the channel. Thank you all. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed the video, why not like and subscribe? It definitely helps me out. If you didn't, why not dislike and let me know what I can improve on for next time? But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I will see you on the next one.